All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, nice to see many of you here in person and uh, lots of people on Zoom. So terrific for our fantastic speaker today. My name is Vinit Chopra. I'm the chairman of the Department of Medicine. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Kimberly Manning, who, judging by the fan club in the back, does not need much of an introduction today. Um, but for posterity, uh, Dr. Manning is Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine, where she is also Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the Department of Medicine. She is a general internist and a hospitalist as well, and serves as both a primary care attending at Grady Memorial Hospital and a general medicine hospital ward attending, roles she has been in since 2001. Uh, Dr. Manning has a strong passion for storytelling as a means to build and strengthen diverse and humanistic clinical environments, as well as cultivating psychologically safe learning climates. Her expertise in this domain, as many of you know, is truly one of a kind, and she has won numerous institutional, regional, and national awards for these efforts. For example, uh, in 2018, she was awarded the ACGME Parker J. Palmer Courage to Teach Award, which is only given to nine program directors across all ACGME residency programs in the U.S. Her work in diversity has been acknowledged to the Society of Hospital Medicine Excellence in Diversity Leadership Award in 2020, and most recently, the AAMC Group on Diversity and Inclusion Exemplary Leadership Award in 2022. What's very special about Kimberly is that she's also a highly decorated educator. Uh, at Emory, she received the Evangeline Papa George Award, the Golden Apple Teaching Award, and the Juha P. Coco Teaching Award. These are the highest teaching awards in the School of Medicine, Grady Hospital, and Emory's Internal Medicine Residency Program, respectively. If you look at her CV, you'll see names of countless students, residents, and faculty, all of whom she has mentored. She has given over 100 invited lectures across the world on topics ranging from how to improve educational conferences to finding joy in medicine and then how to build diverse, inclusive environments for learning. Some of you know, but last week, Dr. Manning published a beautiful thought piece in The Lancet entitled Bigger Than Us, where she describes overcoming her own imposter syndrome and being promoted to full professor. What's very poignant about this piece is the significance of this achievement, not only for her, but also for black women in academia and in medicine. If you have not yet had a chance to read it, please do. Uh, I highly encourage it uh, as a way of thinking about our roles in creating diverse and inclusive environments. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Manning. You are in for a treat. Thank you. I see you. I see you. I didn't make that up. I got that from Dr. Zimmer. Um, let me make sure I know where to click. Do I click down here? Oh, this is a, a clicker. <laughs> Despite all those wonderful things you heard about me, she doesn't know how to use the clicker. Um, hi, everyone. It is my privilege to be here in real life. Um, it is my understanding that because I am on Zoom, I probably should not be doing too much walking around. So I'll kind of stay where I am. But um, I'm really excited to physically be here. I know that for those of you working in clinical environments, it is not easy to get away to do things. And um, it's not lost on me that you chose to come over here. If you are logging in from somewhere and you're listening over Zoom, it's not lost on me that you took the time to do this. And Today, I will be talking to you about something that I think about a lot, and it's the hidden curriculum. And really, um, because as you heard, I'm a storyteller, I'll be taking you on a narrative journey through the hidden curriculum. Make sure I got this right. Okay. See there? Don't, don't judge me, y'all. No, here. Just one quick here, I think. Now try it. Now try it. Okay. Yeah. Look at us. <laughs> See, problem solving for the win. All right. So despite all those wonderful things that you heard, um, I do not have uh, any financial disclosures. My goal is to give a presentation where I list all my disclosures and you see what a big deal I am. Um, regrettably, that is yet to happen. But I do have a disclaimer. Um, my first disclaimer is that everything that I talk about um, is through the lens that I live my life. 
I live my life as a Black American woman. I'm a descendant of human beings who were enslaved in this country and who survived. And, um, and I work at a safety net hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm the daughter of parents from the South and a mom and someone married to an army ranger. And all of those things shape the way that I think and teach and approach things. And when you teach and do things, the same can be said of you. So that is one disclaimer. But the other one is that every single day, 365 days per year, hence me walking up here with a little piece of tissue just in case, I cry at least once. I haven't cried yet today. So it's highly possible that, you know, this might be the moment. I don't know. Um, but I do deeply believe that uh, we need to normalize emotions uh, other than anger and sarcasm um, and indifference uh, in this space. Because medicine is hard. And sometimes that's something to cry about. And I think that's okay. I start every lecture I give with um, a moment of gratitude. Um, actually, I learned that from the person in this picture here who taught me, you know, you might run out of time for dessert. So make sure you eat the dessert up front. And that is what I think of as the gratitude. This is Dr. Shanta Zimmer, as many of you all know. Um, and Shanta and I um, have been friends for a long time. But um, if, if you are lucky enough to have a colleague who looks at you the way that Shanta Zimmer looks at me when I'm trying to do something, you can't lose. Um, this is a couple years ago when I was here as um, the commencement speaker at uh, University of Colorado's College of Medicine, and I was terrified. But I looked and I saw Shanta and I knew it was going to be okay. This is um, the team of residents that I just left yesterday. This picture was taken yesterday. I was on the hospital service. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to work with learners at all levels and also a diverse group of learners. And also, I'm very, very grateful um, for my legacy, which is um, I'm a graduate of Tuskegee University. I'm actually a fourth generation graduate of Tuskegee University. My whole family went there. And um, recently, in partnership with our Department of Medicine, we started um, a longitudinal mentorship program where you can see the dress code I gave them is Tuskegee clothes. Um, but um, I'm very grateful for our influence um, for intention, because the things that we do with intention and zeal make a difference. I'm grateful for legacy because we can overlap our legacy with the work that we are doing in medicine as mentors and as leaders. Um, I'm really grateful for growth. And you will hear a lot about that growth in a few moments. And I'm also especially grateful for connectedness. And as I think about the hidden curriculum, I think about my role um, as, a, as a clinician educator. These pictures are pictures of my medical students, small groups through the years. And um, because I'm you know, a mom who needs to keep track of her kids, I began naming all of my small groups by the Greek alphabet. So small group alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, and iota did not make the picture because they're new. But what I'm showing you is that these are individuals who I spend three days a week with um, as a clinician educator throughout their time in medical school. And that means I have a lot of influence over them. And what that means is that the things that I say and do um, will shape the kinds of doctors that they are. The things I'm saying, the, the things I'm not saying will in, impact them. And to take another one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Zimmer, we make doctors. And those of us who work as clinician educators in this space, even if you are a trainee, you too are part of this commitment to making doctors and making nurses and making patients feel safe. But also we build culture. And um, I know you come to Grand Rounds sometimes and people put up a lot of charts and show you a lot of really complicated algorithms. That ain't about to happen up in here today. I'm just letting you know. So if that's what you're looking for after you heard about me gone and you know, look on Epic and check your notes and do what you're gonna do. Um, <laughs> But, but instead, I, I know that what I'm talking to you about today will be as important as any paper or chart that you will read because the culture that we work in, it shapes what we're able to do for our patients and how our learners are able to thrive and how we are able to get things done. And um, in my conversation this morning with um, Dr. Chopra, we talked about how important relationships are for getting things done. And really culture is really built on these relationships. 
So for those of us that are educational nerds and, you know, doctor by, by definition is to teach, right? Docer, to teach the Latin. Um, so we're all teachers. And um, here's some perspective for all of you. You know, this is Toni Morrison, one of my sheroes. And Toni Morrison, when she wrote her first book at the age of 39, The Bluest Eye, she said, I wrote that book because it was a book I wanted to read. It was the book she could not find and she was looking for it. And so when I get ready to give a talk, I try to give the talk that I want to hear, that I haven't been able to find. And I've heard and read about the hidden curriculum, but I hadn't been able to find this talk. And I want to charge you as educators to teach the things you wish to learn. Give the lectures that you hunger to hear and start the conversations that you wish would begin. And also tell the stories that you need to be told. Because if you aren't telling that story through your unique life lens, who's going to tell it? And that's what Toni Morrison realized. And I think the same can be said for all of us. So you already heard that I'm coming to you live and direct from Atlanta, not live and direct because I'm actually here this time. But um, I bring you greetings from Grady Memorial Hospital, where I've been now for the last 22 years, caring um, for some of the most remarkable human beings I've ever met. And um, these patients... Um, quite frankly, they should win all the teaching awards that we have on our on our um, CVs. They are the ones who are our most esteemed teachers and why I'm even talking about this. So this picture is literally when I was being dropped off on my first day of medical school. My dad was so proud that he drove me to school like I was like in the third grade. Um, and I believe my mom was sitting in the back and took this picture so um, that was in 1992. And I have to say, a lot has changed uh, since that time. And a lot I've learned, I've experienced a lot of things. And the, the hidden curriculum has come up a lot here. And that's part of what we'll be talking about. But um, before I move into some of what I'll share with you, I want to just draw your attention um, to this quote, which I think is one um, that really centers on what we'll be talking about. And it's from Carol Dweck, the author of a book that many of you have heard of called Mindset. She says, becoming is better than being. And I can show you my CV and show you what I've done. That's being. But the becoming piece, you know, or as the Grady elders say, you see the glory, but look, there's a story. And our becoming is the story and the things that stand between what we hear in the classroom and then who we are as doctors. That's the becoming piece. And so if you've never read this book, Mindset, I highly recommend it or listen to it on an audio book if you're busy like me. Um, but I think it's really a good uh, quote for us to center on. So what is the hidden curriculum? I know many of you have heard this term before. It is really something that's embedded in the culture. It's not really a part of our formal or our intended curriculum. It can be positive or it can be negative. It's not always a negative thing what you get. It can conflict with values of the profession. It can happen everywhere. So it's not just on the wards. It's not just in the classroom. It can actually happen when you run into your attending in the supermarket and they are saying something to you that's, huh, that's weird. <laughs> um, or, um, and it can happen even after you graduate. So we often have these discussions about the hidden curriculum as it relates to our most junior trainees, right? We're talking about, oh no, don't, don't do anything to bad, negatively influence the medical students. But we are all medical students, which is why I described myself on that one picture as an M30. Now I'm an M31, hey. Uh, um, but we are all students and we're still being influenced by the things that happen. So some might ask, well, is it even a hidden curriculum since we know it's there? But if it's not on paper for you to show to the LCME or to show to the ACGME, it's probably something that we could call hidden. So what do we mean when we talk about the hidden curriculum? First of all, I like to kind of break it into a few pieces, um, which some of our colleagues have described in the literature. But here's sort of my, my interpretation of it. The formal piece, which is the structured parts. That's the part where when somebody comes in to do a site visit, they're like, show me your curriculum. Show me what you're talking about when it comes to asthma, pulmonary critical care, infectious diseases, GI. What you talking about? Here it is. That's the formal curriculum. Then there's the informal part, the looser parts, right? Like, you know, maybe there's some things that we expect of you, but it's not written down anywhere. The hidden curriculum comes into play 
There are these things that we do and say that nobody said you're supposed to do or say this, but you see it so much that it becomes a piece of the culture. So those are the culture parts. But there's also something that we don't talk about enough, and that is the null curriculum. And the null curriculum are the things we don't say anything about. Right. So the null curriculum was alive and well when I was in training. There were things that people would say and do and I'd be like, nobody saw that. But um, but if nobody's throwing a flag on the play or saying something's wrong, then the truth is that it, it it's like an endorsement. So some of the things we don't say or that we don't acknowledge, particularly in the learning environment, those are parts of what we call a null curriculum and a, a piece of the curriculum in health professions. And the informal curriculum, of course, informs the formal curriculum, the hidden curriculum does too, right? So for example, when I was in medical school, there was no internet. And so everybody went to class. There was class and everybody was there. Every seat was filled. You were trying to get a seat. So you would get there early. Well, with time and technology and some hidden curricula, people are like, oh, that class you don't go to. You watch at home or you watch in Starbucks. This class you do go to. And after a while, nobody told you that we expect you to go to everything, but at some point it affects things. And at some point you might realize that if we don't have anybody at this particular lecture, we might need to revise what we're doing, right? So it can also begin to shape what's happening with the formal curriculum. And what is the impact of the hidden curriculum and also the formal curriculum? The impact is it impacts our becoming who you are, what you'll be like, and what you do for your patients and how you influence your learners will be impacted by all parts of these, this curriculum that I described. So my objectives are really simple. You're going to recognize what the hidden curriculum is. I already told you that part. See, you're almost done. See, there you go. We're going to reflect some on what that means, but also we're gonna regard how that impacts what you are doing every day, no matter where you are, right? And that will be the power of the hidden curriculum. And again, because I'm a storyteller, I'm gonna do this through narrative. And I wanna just say, narrative counts and matters and is how I got promoted. So if you are a storyteller in your soul who sheds a tear every now and then, don't worry there's a place for you in academic medicine too. And there's a, a quote I love that says, tell me the facts and I'll learn. Tell me the truth and I'll believe, but tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. And that's a Native American proverb. And these names and details and these stories, um, some have been changed to protect anonymity, but most of the images are mine and mostly everything here is true in terms of its content. So this is Meharry Medical College. I graduated from Meharry in 1996. And um, I still remember my very first day, that day when my daddy dropped me off at Meharry in Nashville. And um, back in 1992, the very first lecture we got was this lecture called The Privilege of Being a Doctor. We were like, dang, I mean, that's the first lecture that we got. And in walks this really, really like senior like guy with this white coat on. I mean, his white coat was starched so hard that if you took it off, it would just stand up by itself. And he stood at the front of that room and he had his hands behind his back and he was just pacing back and forth. And he was telling us all about the privilege of being a doctor. And re remember, I was at a historically black medical school. So the majority of the people in the room looked like me. And this person at the front of the room looked like me. And so added to that, he was letting us know of the charge for us as black doctors and, and how important it was for us to know what, it, what a great privilege it was. And what he told us is that now that you are a doctor, this comes before everything. Your family, the stuff you wanna do on a weekend, you are gonna have to come in late at night. He was a trauma surgeon, so he was very proud of that. He just kept telling us, this comes up for everything. I miss my son's 16th birthday party. I miss my other son's t-ball games. I was never at the soccer games because I'm a doctor. And this comes before everything. Your family is going to have to understand that. The people you love, they're going to have to understand that. And he kept saying it over and over. This comes before everything. And he was held in high regard. Everybody thought he was amazing. So when he said this comes before everything, that was the gospel. And so I listened and I said, all right, this comes before everything. Got it. Wrote it down with my little in my little spiral book because, you know, no Internet. 
The other thing he told us is that you need to represent at all times. And what that meant was as one of this small number of doctors who looks like you and comes from where you are, your job is to not let anyone down and not to buy into or live up to any of the stereotypes that people say about us as people. So you got to represent, you got to be twice as good to go half as far. All these things, we were told this. And then again, one more time, this comes before everything. But see, I had just left Tuskegee University where I was this girl. And y'all know that was a long time ago because Prince has an Afro on that poster. <laughs> but I digress. Um, but I was still this person on the inside and I was still this kid that was hanging out at the homecoming games at Tuskegee and, and, you know, just being me. But here's this person telling me that I need to button all the way up, be a certain way, walk a certain way, and also deny the things that I had been taught were important to me, which were family, um, because now I'm a doctor and I have the privilege of being a doctor. And not only that, we were constantly reminded of how far we've come as a people, how many people wished, how the ancestors wished they could do what we were doing. So our job was to put everything before this and to represent at all times. And um, this is actually written about recently in a book that came out last year by Jasmine Brown, Twice as Hard, which really mimics exactly what I was heard, told as a medical student early on. And so in all of that, he told us, remember who you are. Remember who you are. This comes before everything. Represent. It was a lot to carry. This is my first day of medical school, the first lecture. I'm like, yo, can I just learn about like embryology, yo? You know, but this is what we were being told. And if you think that was not the hidden curriculum, it was. But then this is who I am. You say, remember who you are. Well, I'm a daughter. Um, I already told you I'm a fourth generation alum of Tuskegee where my parents met, my grandparents met, my great grandmother went there too. Um, very, very close knit family. I'm a sister, um, a middle sister between a valedictorian and a salutatorian. This is us as little kids with our little Tuskegee t-shirts on, not realizing that our parents were going to like brainwash us to go there too. Uh, um, but that's who I am. And then I'm also not just, just a, a sister. I'm close to my sisters. We were thick as thieves. I have an older brother, two sisters. We were very, very, very close. But because I had been told that this comes before everything and that had been drummed into my head over and over again in my second year of medical school, when I sat down to prepare to take step one, I knew that this came before everything. And so, as it turns out, in 1994, when I was preparing to take step one, my sister was about to graduate from law school. My sister was graduating from law school in Birmingham, Alabama, a two and a half hour drive from Nashville. And you know what I did? I told my family I was not going because it was two weeks before step one. And this comes before everything. So I didn't go to my sister's graduation. My family was so puzzled because we're very, very close. And I even went and like said something to a faculty member and they're like, yeah, your family got to understand, you know, you're a doctor now. Is anybody in your family a doctor? I'm like, no, sir. And they're like, yeah, they don't get it. And I, I felt I felt justified. Sorry, not sorry, I told my family. And I wasn't sorry. I got my score back. I admit it wasn't good enough to get um, an interview at Emory, but uh, built my career here. Ha <laughs> ha. But, you know, I did okay. And I was sure that I'd done the right thing. Um, but it was not until May 19th, 1996, when I walked into my own graduation, that I realized what a terrible, terrible mistake I had made. Because my family's too close for this. I mean, I was raised by parents. This is a picture of me with my dad and my siblings. We drove for six weeks across the entire United States to see every US monument for the summer. This is what we did in the Lincoln Continental. We were too close for this, right? Me and my sisters are so close in age that like, we just like grew up on top of each other. I should have been there. And my family should have seen me there too. And not only that, because of this piece of hidden curriculum that I had been told, I robbed my parents of having the, the full picture of having all of their kids together at all of their commencements. My parents had worked hard to get these kids to where they were. 
And I was just two and a half hours away because I had been told on my first day of medical school, this comes before everything. So when I was a third year medical student, I was rotating on the OB uh, rotation and I was working in labor and delivery. And I admit I've always been a crier, but usually, you know, it hadn't really been much of an issue other than my sisters and my brother poking fun at me. But this particular day we were in the labor and delivery and we got called down for unknown dates down to the emergency department. And when we get down there, there's a young woman who is completely dilated, fully effaced and the baby is coming. And out comes this very, very young baby, about 20, 21 weeks tops, eyelids fused, little chest pulling in and out. I had never seen anything like that. And the mother was absolutely devastated, rightfully so. Ian runs family, they're at the bedside with her. Everyone's upset and they're very upset about what's happening, right? So what did I start doing? I start crying. I was like, Oh my God, this is so bad. This mom is not going to go home with her baby. It was her first baby. I was so, so upset. And just as like the third tear was falling out of my eye, I feel something grip my arm really hard. And it was my senior resident who hissed in my ear. We don't do that. We don't do that. Our job is to take care of the patients, not the patients to take care of us. So here's what I need you to do. Go get yourself together and come back. But we don't do that. This was somebody that was going to be the chief resident. She was somebody I looked up to. So when she told me we don't do that, you know, I better go get myself together. I learned then that I better go get myself together because we don't do that. And so in my residency training, I knew where every stairwell was because I had cried in every single one of them. I knew exactly where to go get myself together. I was getting myself together a lot in residency. And that's because residency is hard. I was a med peds resident. I was in the NICU, the PICU, the MICU. I was everywhere. And it was a lot going on at that time. But I spent a lot of time in stairwells um, because I had believed that. And there was nobody there to really refute or correct that for me up until that time. So because I know y'all have cell phones and I know you're thinking and reflecting with me, um, I won't ask you, but I just want you to take a moment to just think for a, a few seconds. What kinds of messages did you do, did you or do you receive about showing emotion or feelings at work? What do you see? What kinds of things do you think? So Cleveland, Ohio is where I went to do my residency. And um, one of the very first people that I worked with in Cleveland, Ohio, was my senior resident who I'll call Antoine M. And I will have to, I have to tell you, Antoine was one of these people, we all know somebody like this who knows everybody in the hospital. He walks through the hospital, everybody's like, what's up, Antoine? He's like, what's up? How your mom and them? They good, good. Oh, for real? Oh, did your little cousin graduate? He did, that's what's up. He knew everybody. And I was like, man, I wanna be like Antoine. But there was something Antoine did when he wrote orders. And I said write orders because we didn't have an electronic medical record. So we took a pen out and we wrote orders back then. But what Antoine did when he wrote his orders is that he always wrote, please. And then he finished it with thank you. Even if it was, please, DC to Foley, please give two milligrams of morphine. Thank you. And then signed it. And he told us as interns, that's a good thing to do. People like it when you say please and thank you. So I started doing what Antoine did. And what happened was, like Antoine, I started knowing everybody in the hospital. And you have to remember that, you know, there were very few people who were doctors who looked like me. So a lot of the people who I had racial concordance with, they were unit clerks. They were environmental services workers. They were food services workers. And I was so happy to see them and they were so happy to see me. So I would be walking through that hospital, seeing everybody. I'd be like, oh, what's up, girl? How you doing? Oh, OK. I like your braids. OK. Are those box braids? Is that right? You know, all that. Right doing all the things. I was really, really excited to see folks. And then another one of those moments where I get grabbed on the arm and someone hisses at me. And this time it was one of the few senior residents besides me and Antoine that looked like us. And I was told, you need to tone all that down. You got to tone all that down. All this, you know, sister girl, hey girl, hey stuff. You got to tone all that down because I don't want people thinking differently of you and that you're not as smart as you are. And I was like, okay, but I was still this girl. And I was trying to figure out how to, to be this girl 
and a doctor at the same time, because I had spent a long time as that girl. But then there were the messages that I was getting in the hospital every day, right? Because I, I was working in a county hospital in Cleveland. Patients who came in who looked like me, people would say all kinds of things, right? That would make me find myself in this weird dichotomy, dichotomous space between remembering who I am and toning things down, right? She's so loud to describe people who are laughing loud and happy. That's so ghetto. Ooh, it's baby mama drama down there. Oh, you went to Tuskegee, the syphilis place, which admittedly, until I started my internship, I was not aware that the rest of the medical world thought of Tuskegee as connected to syphilis. I knew of the untreated syphilis study, but I always thought of the airmen and Booker T. Washington and such. But it wasn't until I went in that space, I kept hearing that. Mahari, nobody would pronounce the name of my school well. People would ask me, did I want to go there? And then I remember somebody describing a patient as having crack hair. I don't know if her urine drug screen is positive, but she definitely had crack hair and the whole team exploded in laughter. And so that led to an identity theft. What I knew for sure is that I didn't want anybody to connect me to any of that. And so I knew that I would need to come to work and I would need to be somebody else every day. And that is what I did. I came in, I talked to different, I walked different. I showed interest in things that I had never heard of before. And the truth is I was rewarded for it because I was trying to represent. I was trying to do what I had been told to do. And so I began to code switch for survival. And if you're trying to learn about hyponatremia and how to manage DKA, and at the same time, you got to try to be somebody other than who you are, somebody who you've been for 25 years, that's a really, really hard cognitive load to lift. But I lifted it every day, got asked to be chief resident. It was like working for me. We'll go home with my roommate and hey girl, hey over there and then come back to work and put on my mask again. But the hidden curriculum was reinforcing that for me. And not just the hidden curriculum from what people were saying, but the people who code switched and who behaved differently than me and who weren't like me, they were the ones who were propelled into leadership roles. And that was hard and I wanted to succeed. So as an intern, one of the things we often heard um, when you were on call or anything, was that um, right before a call started, somebody would tell you, be a wall, meaning go to the emergency department and reject everything. The best thing you could possibly do in the emergency department is, is to stop a patient from getting admitted to your service. We call that being a wall. So I was working with a senior resident who was probably one of the most notorious walls of all time in our hospital. And she was like, all right, you got a new admission. Um, and this new admission, I'm telling you right now, it is, it is, it is, it shouldn't be admitted. I tried to block it, but it's not happening. So this dude is a frequent flyer. You know, it's a really soft admission. Um, he's malingering. He's here all the time. So he probably just won a couple of square meals. Um, this dude is non-compliant, And, you know, honestly, it's a BS admission. Again, I looked up to the senior resident um, and I was like, okay. I went over there with that in my head. So I walked downstairs to the emergency department to meet a patient well, call Mr. Porter. And I had just come off of my emergency medicine rotation and I had built relationships with the uh, faculty in the emergency department. So when I got down there, the attending that was admitting the patient says, oh, Kimberly, I'm so glad it's you. I'm so happy to see you. I'm like, yeah, sorry, it's good to see you too. It's, he went by his first name, one of those cool attendings. Call me John. I was like, John, what's up, John? He's like, yeah, this man, he's telling me all about him. And I go and I see Mr. Porter and I say, all right, you know what? If I can get Mr. Porter into the clinic and I can set up his follow up and everything, I'm going to leverage my relationship with John to get him up out of this hospital. So I go back to John. I say, hey, he's hypertensive, but, you know, he doesn't have any target organ damage. Um, I got him appointment in clinic. I'll see him myself. I'll call him, blah, blah, blah. And John is like, great. I love it. So, Kimberly, thank you so much. We will we will discharge him. And let me tell you. I didn't care nothing about Mr. Porter. All I knew was I was getting ready to call my senior resident and tell her that I was a wall where she could not be. You couldn't block this patient, but I could. So I called my senior resident on a landline. For those of you who don't know what that is, because we didn't have no cell phones. So I called her. And she picks up the phone. She, she pages me right back. And I say, yo, because I didn't think anybody was near me. 
The BS bro is out the dough. She said, strong work, the intern. I almost had SVT. I was so happy. I was like, yeah, she's like, oh my God, what did you do? I was like, oh, I made him a clinic appointment. She's like, that's what's up. If I was there, I would give you a hug. I'm like, yeah. And then I hang up the phone and I'm smiling. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I hear somebody say, hey, uh, Kimberly, I was like, got to be more careful. Turn around is John and he says, hey, uh, I heard what you said about our patient. He didn't say my patient. He didn't say the patient. He said our patient. He said, you know, my senior resident and I, we were very worried about Mr. Porter. We don't have the connections to the clinic that you do. And we were just very, very worried about him. Um, he also has a lot of um, issues with his family and didn't have or like we weren't sure how he was going to follow up and how he was going to get here. And I have to say, working with you before, I'm so disappointed to hear you talking about him that way. And that senior resident that you're working with, she's really tired right now. And I know that you are better than that. But why don't you go back and talk to Mr. Porter and find a little bit more about who he is. Turns out Mr. Porter wasn't just the BS bro. He wasn't that at all. He was a grandfather. He was a husband. He was a gardener. This was Cleveland, y'all. So he was a bowling champion. Mm. He owned his house outright, as he told me. But he was especially a human being. And I hadn't even thought about any of that. That wasn't being modeled for me. To me, he was just another person on a list that was going to make me have more work to do and more to stay up for. And, you know, as I've grown older, I thought about my own father, you know, my late father, who was a lot of these things, too. And then this other piece of remembering who I am. John showed me in that moment, remember who you are, which is an empathic person who should know better than the way you were just talking. And I really appreciated that. But it really took me more years of living to fully appreciate what it means when we dehumanize our patients, because I still continue to fall short. This is, again, my late father. And uh, my father had a stroke in April of 2022 and was admitted to the hospital, discharged home. And within 24 hours, we had to bring him back to the hospital because it, it was just too much at home. And when I called and talked to the hospitalist, I said, hey, do you think the team that took care of my father before could take care of him now? And the doctor said to me, colleague to colleague, we don't have a bounce back policy. And he was saying that because that is the language that we use to describe patients who have left and who have come back. And I wrote about it. Once I got far enough away from it, because the other thing we can do is we can shape culture too by the stories that we tell. And I asked my team every time I hear them say that word, hey guys, can we say return patient instead? And now at Grady, I hear people saying that, hey, we have a return patient, this return patient, you guys have a return patient. And I'm telling you this story because if you are somewhere in a clinical environment, I'm asking you, to say that too. So I'd like you to just pause and reflect again about what is something you learned through culture in medical school or residency that might not be patient-centered? It hits a lot different when it's your loved one. It does. And if you keep living, you will feel it. So as I told you, I was a MedPeds resident and I was in the most terrifying place of my clinical training, which was the PICU. And the PICU was rough, I have to tell you. And while I was there, I was caring for this young woman, this young girl named Camille. And this was back uh, in 1998. And Camille was this really precocious, cute kid who had spent the summer um, with all of her cousins. They were all at the lake and having the greatest, greatest time. And she was around the age of my son here with his own cousins. And unfortunately, Camille's family brought her to the emergency department because she had developed a fever and a rash after uh, being with our family. Well, as it turns out, this fever and this rash will continue to get worse. It will be coupled with renal dysfunction. She had a petechial rash. And unfortunately, Camille had the hemolytic, hemolytic uremic syndrome. I had never seen anybody with the hemolytic uremic syndrome. I read about it and I knew that it was bad news, but I'd never seen it with my own eyes. Camille got very, very sick. I took care of her for that whole time because I was the person who admitted her. And it got really rough. There were a few times that, you know, Camille got very, very close um, to passing away. And then on one Saturday, while I was in the PICU with my attending and with the nurses, 
um, Camille lost her pulse again. And our whole team, we worked and worked and worked on Camille until finally my attending called it. And as soon as he called it, I felt my face getting hot and I felt myself feeling shaky and like I was going to cry. And I was like, I got to get out of here. And my, my attending was blocking the door. And I was like, I got to go get myself together because that's what I had been taught. And this attending thought I was a good, good resident. And then I noticed something. My attending was crying in sheets, he was staring at the floor and just sheets were falling out of his eyes. I was like, wait, what? I thought, wait, you need to go get yourself together, sir. What you doing? And I said, I thought we weren't supposed to cry like this. And he, my attending looked at me and said, a parent has lost their child. That's something to cry about. I said, dang. And he said, let's go talk to the family. And I said, but don't we need to get ourselves together? And he looked at me again and he said, a parent has lost their child. That's something to cry about. And we went and we talked to that family and my attending cried again with the family. And that day I learned that it's not so much about crying in front of people. We can cry with people because we're human. And I have to say, I, I never respected my attending more than I did in that moment. And he was pretty dope, y'all. But that was a real powerful moment. And that's what got me crying in grand rounds in front of y'all. Like, oh, well, we crying now. Throughout my pediatrics residency, I got very good at procedures. I was one of those residents that was very good at procedures. And I was a machine. They would say, Kimberly is a machine. You call her in there to do something, she going to do it and be out of there in five seconds. I was very proud of that. And so one night I was the senior most resident um, in the house on peds. I was fast asleep in my call room and a PGY2 called me and said, we can't get this LP and this IV. Can you come help us? And I told them I'm coming, but you better have everything ready when I get there. I don't want no family in the room. I don't want a whole lot of people in my way. Just have everything ready. And they were like, okay. So I put on my clogs and I marched down the hall really fast. There's these two people in the hallway, clearly the parents of this baby who look very, very worried. Don't even make eye contact with him. Walk right past him, pushed into the treatment room, walked in, wear my six and a half gloves, put my six and a half gloves on because this had been modeled for me. Put my gloves on, did the LP, one stick, wow, ah, clear. That's right. Took those gloves off. Where's the, where's, where's the IV? Put the IV in. I didn't even stay to tape the IV. As soon as I got a flash, I flushed it. I just handed the extremity to the intern, flipped off the gloves and walked out past the, past the, the parents. And I know they were back there like, dang, she's awesome. She's a machine. And I was a machine because again, that's what had been modeled for me. But these were human beings. And now all these years later, you know, I became somebody's mother. And I just cannot imagine if somebody had been doing to, ch to my children the things that I was doing to patients, and I did care, but again, what had been modeled to me through the hidden curriculum is that we get things done, we're a machine, we hit it, we leave, we this, we that, and that was what was rewarded. And, and the next day when I walked in the report, people walked in there like I was Norm from Cheers. If you're too young, Google Norm from Cheers. But I walked in, they were like, yo, hey. I was like, yeah, 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 calm down, y'all. It was nothing. It was just the three IVs y'all couldn't get. Um, but over time, again, this began um, to be something that was reinforced for me. But also things that were reinforced in residency were the things that people said about people because I had developed a reputation as a machine, as somebody who was very good because of my excellent code switching and somebody that was gonna be chief resident. But then one day when I was on call, we were all hanging out in the, um, the resident lounge and somebody says, hey, who's on with you tonight? And somebody names a resident who was my friend. And everybody started talking about this resident because she had gotten this reputation as somebody who wasn't a good resident. They said things like, oh, she's legit horrible. Yikes. She's the worst. I barely understand her. She's not an assassin. That's what the, that was the one nice thing somebody had to say about her. But the worst thing of all 
came from somebody that was probably one of the most loved residents in our program. He said, she's like an accessory nipple, useless and in the way. And the whole room exploded in laughter. And then she walked in to take sign out. Everybody like straightened up. And that was wrong, but I didn't do anything because I didn't want that heat to come on me. So I'm like, keep that all over there. I'm over here trying to be, you know, this black girl from two HBCUs that I don't want y'all to start looking at me that way. But this is something that, you know, we've described, it's called reputational inertia. And that's this idea that when people start saying something about someone, especially depending upon who's saying it, it can snowball and it can be a really hard thing to shake. And if you wonder why some people have such a hard time being remediated, maybe it's not them at all. Maybe it's the hidden curriculum creating a narrative about who they are and none of us standing in a way to stop it. So I just ask you to pause and reflect. Is there a time that you can think of where you wish you'd spoken up for someone and you didn't? That day that I didn't speak up for that co-resident remains one of my biggest regrets as a colleague because I was actually cool with her. We had rotated together and I knew she was highly competent. In fact, she was way more competent than me. But people had decided that she wasn't good and I didn't do anything to try to correct that. So one of the last people I'll tell you about, this is um, what was my clinic attending, Dr. P. Dr. P was so smart, so kind, so good at primary care internal medicine. But see, primary care internal medicine when I was in training, that wasn't the sexy thing. The thing that was sexy were the things that were people were doing procedures and the things were, you know, that were really hard to match into and everything. And so she was never a person that we selected for cheap, for any of the teaching awards or anything. Um, however, I was with her so much as a clinic attending um, that it would take me many, many years to realize the level of influence that she had on me. I liked the way she talked to people. I liked the way she was at the bedside. I liked the way she gave feedback. And to this very day, there are things that I do identical to Dr. P. But the hidden curriculum had said that people like Dr. P were not the decorated teachers. She was soft-spoken. She was a petite woman. Um, it was all these things that didn't quite fit the picture of who wins in that space. So I never really thought of her as an awesome teacher until later when I started doing things and realizing how much of her influence I had in me. This is me during the pandemic, sitting at this little table in Grady Hospital that we called the no judgment zone, where we would just let people come up and ask us stuff about the vaccine and about COVID. And when I looked at this picture, one of my classmates said, you look like Dr. P on that picture. That looks just like Dr. P, the way you holding that patient's hand and looking them all in the face. I was like, that sure does. But I never thought of her as such a powerful influence. And she's probably one of the people I carry the most with me from my training, but never once did I see her win an award. So in closing, I'm gonna take you back to 2001 when I was getting ready to leave Cleveland, Ohio. I was board eligible. I, oh, I was board certified because I had been chief resident. Dang, I was I had a job, I was ready to go. And I was in the very last week of my chief residency. And, um, Back then, we didn't have a Jeopardy system. What we had was if somebody decided to go on sabbatical, you called the chief resident and said, hey, guess what? You're going to be the attending this week. And that is what happened to me in the last week of June when I was getting ready to move to Atlanta. So when my chair came and told me that I was about to be covering the hospital service in my last week, somebody just like you, Dr. Chopra, looked at me all nice, like they believed in me. I said, oh, yes, sir. Just like that. So I was mad. I was mad, y'all. I was <laughs> I was trying to get up out of there and move to Atlanta. I was supposed to be packing that week. I was very, very upset. And I was working with some interns who were ready to be PGY2s. Everybody thought they knew everything. The senior resident had already matched in something and was ready to go. It was just not really a fun time on wards. And so I'm down there seeing this capped team. I'm very, very busy. I'm exhausted. And I get this call from the nurse's station. And the nurse says, hey, you need to come up here. This is something for the attending's attention. And I was like, my senior resident is up on the floor. I'm down in radiology looking at actual films with my foot because no internet. Um, and I'm like, man, I can't come up there right now. She's like, you got to come up here. This requires the attention of the attending. It cannot be the senior resident. 
And I'm asking, like, she's like, stop asking so many questions. You need to come up here. This is very, very important. And so me at this point, again, because I'm not in a happy place and I have been asked, you know, again, to cover the service for my attending that had just decided to randomly take a sabbatical. I go upstairs and um, as I'm walking up on the ward, huffing and puffing and sliding, stomping in my clogs, I look and I see all of these nurses and all of these people standing there like a surprise birthday party almost. I was like, oh, this is very weird. So I start looking, I'm like, uh, I know it's not my birthday. And then they kind of part like the Red Sea. And then on the table, they point at something. And it's two dozen long stem roses. And they all like, you got some roses. You got some roses. Who, who sent you some roses? Let me tell you, in Cleveland, Ohio, there was nobody unluckier in love than me. So I knew for sure, I was actually very afraid when I saw those roses. I said, I do not know who sent me roses. I don't know who would send me roses. This is very, very concerning. They're like, well, there's a card on it. Can we look at who wrote it? And I was like, yeah, y'all can look. I don't know who this is going to be. So I take the card and I open it and I look at it. And it was like somebody sucked me in my chest and knocked all the wind out of my chest. I couldn't even speak. And I hand the card to one of the senior nurses who had worked with me since my first day of internship. And she puts her hand on her chest and she just starts shaking her head. And then she reads it and it says, I already cried once, so I'm not gonna cry again. To the please and thank you, doctor. Thank you for always taking time to be kind. Please don't ever stop. Wishing you the best in your future endeavors in Atlanta. Respectfully, the hospital operators. <laughs> so <laughs> when I used to call down to the operators as an intern, I would always say, who is this? And they'd say, this is Dreama. I'm like, hey, Dreama, how are you doing? I'm good. Okay. Do you think Canada needs to get their weather back? Girl, I know we would be, I knew every operator, every name of every operator. And I'd never been down there to see them. I had actually had this whole thing in my head of what the operators looked like. I was like, okay, Charles is like six, eight. And he's like a really big dude. And Dreama is like 4'10". And she got a special headset because she's so tiny. And then, you know, Julia is transgender. And this, like I had all these things for every single person who, that, that I knew. I was like, okay, I knew whoever person was. And I picked those flowers up and I walked down to the, um, down to the, to the um, area where the operators are. And nobody was like I thought they were. Julia was taller than me. Um, Charles was like five, six. <laughs> and they said, you brightened our day for five years because every time you called down here, you were kind. And I had that model for me by Antoine. And it's something I do to this very day. So my take home messages are, the hidden curriculum is fluid and it's ongoing. We all play a part in the hidden curriculum. What we say or do, it matters. But what we don't say, and what we don't do, it matters too. And we have the power to shift the culture. Because I'm a medical educator, I gotta give you some homework. And the homework is that I need you to recognize reflect and regard the power of the hidden curriculum and keep the conversations going, talking about your experiences with the hidden curriculum. What things did you learn? What things were taught to you? What things do you wish to shake up? What's your experience like somebody calling your dad a bounce back? And even more homework, what are you saying? What are you not saying? Reflect on three experiences that deeply impacted you. Reflect on three people that deeply impacted you. And what is one way that you can be more intentional with hidden curricula? Because remember, what I learned from Antoine was positive. Very, very positive. What I learned from watching Dr. P was positive. What I learned from my attending in that PICU was that it's okay for me to feel emotion because when people lose loved ones, that can be something to cry about. And that's okay. So what are some things that you can be more intentional about? And in closing, 
Never underestimate the power of your influence. This is a young woman that I met at a Tuskegee homecoming several years ago. She aspired to go to medical school. She has since become a medical student at Emory. She's in her third year now. It's me and my little sister in our Tuskegee t-shirts. These are my sons in their little Tuskegee t-shirts. And this is my son who is now a fifth generation student at Tuskegee University wearing the same jacket as his grandfather. Never underestimate the power of your influence because we make doctors and we build culture. Thank you. He thinks I need a hug. <laughs> it's pretty hard to ask for questions after that. I'm sure we're all processing, but we have a few minutes yeah. with Dr. Manning. Questions or comments or thoughts for Dr. Manning? I'm going to see about finding a microphone. I think there's some sitting in the back. Thank you. Hello, is this working? Hi. Thank you so much for sharing very tender moments from your life. That was really special. I think my question for you is, many of us probably resonate with the recognition of a past version of you that you aren't the most proud of, right? The part that snapped her gloves off after walking past the patient's parents and the feeling of regret or shame that comes with having existed as a version of you aren't proud of now. Can you share a little bit how you speak to or how you relate to that old version of yourself to work? It's very simple. Becoming is better than being. It's a story of becoming. It's part of my becoming. And, you know, we're not our mistakes. We're our possibilities. I mean, that's, that's the truth. That's literally what I tell myself. I mean, I tell my sons all the time, look, I was never a mom before I was your mom. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. And my older son, I'm like, I've never had a kid in college. I don't know how to do this yet. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but becoming is better than being. And I think we have to uh, recognize that just as our patients are human and they get assigned all these words like non-compliant, non-adherent, all these things, right? It's really just human beings trying to figure it out. And sometimes we fall short and sometimes we nail it. Um, and I realize that 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 I count in that too. So so yeah, I, I I will tell you it's very hard for me to think about that resident that I did not stand up for because she was my friend. Um, but I also realized that the hidden curriculum had created so much fear in me, um, and because of my identity, I really did not want to do anything that would move the spotlight onto me. And I was staying under the radar, and I wanted to stay there but I regret it. And I cannot have back my sister's um, graduation. But what I do know is that now I'm a senior faculty member influencing a whole lot of medical students. And I tell them that story. I say, this does not come before everything. It does not. These patients are gonna be here when you get back, go love on your families. And sometimes they have to tell me back the things that I've told them. They say, Dr. Manning, we want you to do what you would make us do. Becoming is better than being. And I'm going to mess up something tomorrow, probably, but I'll forgive myself. Other questions, comments? Thanks so much, Kimberly. Um, what you just said prompted me to have a question, which was that um, sometimes your learners reflect things back to you. Um, I think that that is a piece of the hidden curriculum that we still don't do a good job with, which is giving young people um, on our teams, younger people on our teams, junior people, the opportunity to to correct the mistakes that we're making. How do you um, set that culture on on your team so that people can tell you, take care of yourself or, you know, well, we're not going to use that word bounce back again, remember? 
So the question is um, about how do you create a climate that allows people that are at a different space, lower than you on a hierarchy, to be able to throw a flag on the play to correct things that you're doing that aren't right. Um, I'm maniacal about the learning climate. I think about it so much. And so um, trying to create a safe learning environment allows you to have a space where people feel comfortable telling you what's okay and what's not okay. I start off with my expectations and I let them know that, hey, listen, there's going to be a whole bunch of things that you know better than me because you just took step one. And like, yo, I, I memorized Krebs cycle like back in the day. Uh, and I don't remember some of that stuff. So I want everybody here to feel sure that what they have to say is worth me hearing because there are a lot of things I don't remember. I also have a lot of language for when I don't know and when I'm uncertain that I've practiced. I say often to my team, probably every day, I was right now years old when I learned that. Dang, I didn't know that for real. Um, I, or I say, this might represent a gap in my knowledge. In fact, I know it does. Does somebody know this? And when you start hearing people say things like that all the time, then you feel confident stepping up. Or I say, oh, you know what, Shanta, you might know this um, because I know this is something that's your jam. What, do you know this? And a lot of times if you're a student and you have the right answer, that feels good. But I also um, will say that um, as part of my uh, building of the climate, usually when I come in, I don't start with work. I usually start off asking somebody a question that has nothing to do with, um, I ask the team, where are you on a scale of one to five? And what's the last delicious thing you ate? That's usually like, I'll, I'll come up with some culture question, but priming everybody to talk about things that are not related to medicine, it then lets everybody speak out loud once, hear their voice out loud, and then give them the space to talk about something that may not be related to patient care. And it was because of that, that when my father was sick, I was on wards and I was trying to finish out my time on the hospital service because I did not want to burden anybody by making somebody have to come in and cover my service. And my intern came up to me and said, you need to go home. You need to get on a plane and go to California and be with your family. And I said, it's nothing for me to do there. She said, yes, it is. You need to just go be with your family because that's what you would make us do. And I think it was because that time over time, having all those conversations about, you know, eating falafel at the spot over here, it seems in, inconsequential, right? But those are the things that create the space that make people comfortable saying things to you that don't relate to hyponatremia. Right. Um, and so I, I, I would like um, to just urge all of you, if you don't regularly think about how you build a learning climate, furthermore, if you're going to give somebody feedback that um, is corrective, that those kinds of conversations let people know that you care about them. And once they know you care and you start giving feedback, they'll receive it differently and they'll give you feedback. We are at time. Uh, Dr. Manning, thank you. Thank so you much, so uh, much for your wisdom. Uh, Dr. Manning will be our keynote speaker at the Mentorship Academy on Friday. So if you want more of Dr. Manning, as I'm sure we all do, Friday, she will be doing that as well. Thanks very much. In your